Hello, my name is Stuart Pym. I'm the Doris Street Professor of Conservation Ecology at Duke University in the United States. I'm so sorry that I can't be with you in person today. I'm afraid I'm not feeling very well and just was not up to making the flight to Rio de Janeiro last night. Even though it's a city I care about, it's a beautiful place, and Brazil's biodiversity, the subject I'm going to talk about, as you will see, is a subject I care very much about indeed. I'm here to honour Luisa Sartori, a student in my class last fall who was tragically killed in a car accident. You'll hear from Luisa later in a video clip that I recorded of her last October. And as you will see, she too shares a passion for Brazil and the extraordinary biological diversity that you have in your country. A few years ago, I reviewed the various impacts that we are having on our planet. We are consuming a lot of natural resources and some of them we are not using sustainably. Tropical deforestation is progressing at such a pace that in the next 30 or 40 years, large areas of tropical forests may exist almost nowhere on Earth. We're also driving species to extinction at unprecedented rates, perhaps a hundred to a thousand times their natural background rate. Now, as I shall show, Brazil is an exceptionally biodiverse country. It has the Earth's largest tropical forest. And if one is going to be concerned about biodiversity, we have to address what is going on in Brazil. As you can see from this map of plant diversity, Brazil is exceptionally rich in plant species. The Amazon, the Cerrado, the coastal forests of Brazil, the Mata Atlantica, are exceptionally rich even by the standards of tropical forests worldwide. With other groups of species, we can map out those details at a much finer scale. This is a map which is not a familiar one to many people in the United States. It's a map based on a soccer ball, a mixture of pentagons and hexagons, which you map the Earth's surface onto that and then open it up. And when you do that, you come to a conclusion that is quite disturbing to many people in the United States. And that is, the United States is quite small relative to South America and Africa and other parts of the world. This is an equal area projection. It also shows that there are very few species of amphibian in, in Canada and in Northern Europe. There are a few more in the United States. Things begin to get interesting when you start speaking Spanish and when you start speaking Portuguese, one has a lot of species. The great majority of the world's amphibian species are found in Brazil. Just looking at the Americas, the map on the left shows the number of bird species, again in very great detail. The Amazon basin in particular has exceptionally high biodiversity. But there is another point about these maps, and that's the map on the right. The map on the left has all the species of birds found in the Americas. But on the right, my colleagues Clinton Jenkins and I have only mapped those species that have the smallest geographical ranges. We lined the species up from smallest to largest and took only the bottom half. And what you see is that only special places are rich in species with small geographical ranges. 
places such as the Sierra Madres of Mexico, Central America, the, the Andes, and of course, the Mata Atlantica of Brazil. It's places where species have small ranges that are where extinctions tend to occur because species with small ranges are much more vulnerable to extinction than species with large ranges. If you look at mammals, you see a map that's extraordinarily similar. Again, the greatest number of mammal species occur in the lowlands of, of the Amazon. But the places where the most vulnerable species occur are special and different. It, again, includes the, the Mata Atlantica. So, Brazil is exceptionally diverse, but it's also vulnerable to, to changes in its, its forests because it has these areas where species with small geographical ranges are concentrated. We call them, of course, biodiversity hotspots. Quite simply, for many, many years, Brazil was clearing something like 15 to 20,000 square kilometers of its tropical forests per year. Places like this, the canopy of the, the rainforest um, just north of Manaus, is a remarkable place and a place that I hope that my children and my grandchildren will get to see because forest here is disappearing quickly. If you look at this map of where forest was, that's the areas of green and red, and then look at the areas where there has been a loss of forest, you can see that the Caribbean, the islands of Cuba and Hispaniola, the northern Andes, but especially the Atlantic Coast forest, have lost very, very large areas of their forest cover and most of this has happened within the last 50 or maybe 100 years. So, the special combination of high numbers of endemic species, those found only in these special places, plus the loss of these habitats and the special vulnerability of the species there, those factors combined predict where extinctions are. So the middle map at the top is a map of forest loss. The map at the right is where species with small ranges are to be found. And then when you map out where threatened species are to be found in the Americas, you see that the Mata Atlantica of Brazil is the most important place in all of the Americas if we're going to prevent species from going extinct. Working in uh, particularly the state of Rio de Janeiro is the front line if we are to save biological diversity. Well, before we go much further, how sure are we that we know where species are? How complete is the taxonomic catalogue? Are we sure that we found all the species in Brazil? In particular, do we know where Brazil's threatened species are, the ones that are particularly vulnerable? I'm going to be using maps of where species are found to set practical conservation actions. But I want to be sure that in doing so, we're trying to conserve the right places. The basic idea of predicting how many species there are is to extrapolate from the numbers of species described each year. As many people expect, as you have fewer and fewer species that are unknown to science, that the number of species that will be described by taxonomists each year should decrease. 
It's a great idea, but it fails badly. If you look at the number of species of flowering plants in Brazil, this is actually the Brazilian Amazon, you can see that it's increasing very rapidly indeed. There appear to be unlimited numbers of species of plants in the Amazon, and that can't possibly be right. The complication is that the number of people who are describing those plants, the number of taxonomists, is also increasing rapidly. So if we're going to have some sense about how many plant species remain to be discovered, we have to correct the number of species by the effort that went into to catching them, as it were, to describing them. And that's what these graphs do at the left. They look at the number of species of plants described in the different parts of Brazil, but divide them by the number of taxonomists who are active in, in doing those descriptions. And when you do that, you see that, in fact, the rate of species described for the effort involved, the number of taxonomists, is indeed dropping down. And we can build a mathematical model. It's shown at the bottom of the page. I don't think we need to go into it in any detail. But what it allows us to do is to predict how many more species we're likely to find in different parts of Brazil. Northern Brazil, which is mostly the Amazon, there may be 20-25% more species to be described. Southeastern Brazil, as you might expect, is a lot better known. But notice there's a lot more endemic species in Brazil. It's one of these areas where endemic species are concentrated. Northeastern Brazil is still yielding a lot of new species. So there's a bunch more species still to be found. Well, what about vertebrates? We think we know vertebrates very well. And indeed, the rates of descriptions of mammals and amphibians of birds are dropping very, very rapidly. Brazil is, in fact, one of the few places where one can still find new species of birds, but we don't think there are many more left. This suggests that the priorities for conservation that we make based on a knowledge of species of birds and amphibians and so on are likely to be pretty good. We know most of the species involved. But there's a complication. If we look at the geographical range size of species of birds, those described for Brazil, or species that occur in Brazil, in the late 1700s, had huge geographical ranges. Geographical ranges typically of, of a million square kilometers or more. By the time people were describing Tijuca congita, a bird found only in the mountaintops of the state of Rio de Janeiro. Um, a species like that has a tiny range, and as you might expect, it was discovered much more recently. So we're discovering the rare species only in relative recent times. So let me tell you what that red line represents. That red line represents the, the number of species, the total number of species, that have a range area of less than 20,000 square kilometers. That's a very tiny geographical range. Anything that is that small means that the species is almost certainly threatened with extinction. And when we look at those data, we realize that we have only known these small-ranged species for a relatively short period of time. These are the data for, for amphibians, and we've known half of Brazil's amphibians with small ranges only in the last 30 years. 
That means that we are only very recently beginning to find the species that are, are really rare. And of course, it's those species that we are most concerned about. So, to conclude the first two sections of my talk, we're losing biological diversity worldwide 100 to 1,000 times faster than, than it should be going extinct naturally. The species that are at risk of extinction are predominantly those with small geographical ranges. And Brazil has a lot of those species. By and large, we think we know where they are, but even for well-known taxonomic groups, there's still an awful lot about Brazil that we do not know. So, that's the basis of our understanding of Brazilian biodiversity. So what, what's happening in Brazil? What are we doing in Brazil? What are conservation biologists doing in Brazil? I want to talk about four ideas. One involves how successful we can be using local initiatives to, to protecting the special places where threatened species live. I'm going to talk about the importance of indigenous groups. I'm going to say quite a bit about how Brazil and Norway have come together to, um, to, to, to save the world, to, to reduce the tropical deforestation um, and in doing so, have a major impact in reducing global carbon emissions. And, of course, talk about the potential loss of species from, from global change and how we must address global change if we are going to save biological diversity. This is a map of where the forest is in the Mata Atlantica. It's a place of extraordinary diversity, and as you can see, the state of Rio de Janeiro is extraordinarily rich. There are 200 or so endemic birds in, in the Mata Atlantica, 4,000 endemic plants, um, large numbers of amphibians and reptiles and mammals and insects, surely. So this is an internationally significant area. This is a view, I'm sure many of you know where this is taken. It's not far from here. If you look out over the lowlands of the state of Rio de Janeiro, you see the problem. There is forest, but it's in small fragments. There are very few areas of, of continuous forest. These are three satellite images of the state, it's essentially the entire state. And as you can see, what must have been once upon a time all green is now only green in the mountains. Most of the lowland forest is gone. Large areas have been cleared for, for the cities, for agriculture, and so on. Let's zoom in and take a closer look at those forests. So this is just north of where you are today. The areas in forest are substantial, but notice how many of those areas are really tiny. There's a lot of small bits of green on that map. In the next slide, I'm going to subtract all the pieces of green that are smaller than one square kilometer. Notice that a lot of forest, about 15% of the forest, is in patches smaller than one square kilometer. And indeed, if I'd have chosen, say, 10 square kilometers, then a lot of forest would disappear from even this image. That's important because species don't do well in forests. And we know that from an extraordinary study that was done in Brazil, an experiment that's still running. It's a collaboration between, um, this initially between the Smithsonian Institution and INPA, 
and it's a study of what happens to species in fragments. The BDFFP was an idea that came from forests being cleared in an area just north of Manaus. This image is about 30 kilometers from east to west. This is off the road that runs northward from Manaus all the way to Boavista and beyond. The area was being cleared for, for farmland, for, for grazing land. And as the area was cleared, some experimental plots were set aside of different sizes, one hectare, 10 hectares, 100 hectares. The idea that Tom Lovejoy had was that we could count the numbers of species at the time that the forest was intact, and then over time, we could look at how quickly species disappeared from the fragments. And from that, we could work out, as it were, a half-life, the time it would take to lose half the species that we think are going to be lost eventually. This is important because we need to know not only how few species will be lost from, say, large fragments versus small fragments, but we need to know how long we have. How quickly must we act to protect Brazil's biodiversity? This is a complicated slide, and it includes data from Manaus and also from Kakamega, a similar study that my research group did in, in Kenya. But the basic idea is this, that if you have fragments of only one hectare or so, then you lose half of your species within just a few years. 10 hectares, maybe a decade, 100 hectares, at most 20 or 30 years. You need to have fragments that are at least a thousand hectares, 10 square kilometers, if you're going to slow the rate of species loss. So let's go back and look at the state again. In this map, my colleague uh, Clinton Jenkins and I have made a computer model of where we think endangered birds should be found. Only those areas that have forest cover are covered. But instead of coloring them all the same color, we have used different colors to represent the number of, of threatened species. Red is 16 or more threatened species. When you see that, what immediately jumps out is there is an area to the east of the city that is particularly rich in endangered species. Let's take a closer look. This is a three-dimensional representation of that. To the left, we have Guanabara Bay and across the city. But in the mountains to the north of you, and particularly to the east, are areas that have forest, but notice that the areas of forests that have the greatest number of threatened species are in the lowlands. In fact, these areas have more threatened species than anywhere else in all of the Americas. State of Rio de Janeiro has the dubious honor of being the place where there are more species of just about everything threatened with extinction than anywhere else from Tierra del Fuego to Patagonia. This is a closer map. Some of these places are going to be familiar to you. I'm certain that many of you may do some of your field work. There's um, Poso dos Antes, there's Herbio Union, and where that red circle is, is 
or was, an area of cattle pasture. Yuniao is an isolated forest fragment. It's quite a big one. But quite clearly, it's going to lose its species, not just of birds, but of plants and of mammals, of butterflies or insects. It's going to lose its species because it's isolated. Here's what it looks like on the ground. That's a cattle pasture. It separates the, the reserve, which is off to the left, from continuous forest off to the right. And of course, the reserve is famous not so much for its birds, uh, but for the, the golden lion tamarind, Mico Leon Dorado. This is a spectacular and interesting animal, and its survival depends on, on having more habitat and of connecting those isolated patches. This suggests something that we can do. Working with Association Mico Leon Dorado, a conservation organization that I run called SavingSpecies.org, and IUC in the Netherlands, was able to raise money to give to the Golden Lion Tamarind Group. And you can see the consequences of this. We were able to buy uh, the money. We were able to buy the land um, that was previously cattle pasture. Uh, we helped um, the association uh, raise the money for that, buy the land, get rid of the cattle from the land. And as you can see, here's some wonderful school children who are replanting that former cattle pasture so that there will now be connections between the forest. We are restoring this land so it will no longer be a fragment. Restoring the connections between forest in the Mata Atlantica is a major conservation success story one made possible by the energies of Denise Hambaldi and other people at the uh, Golden Lion Tamarind Association. And I have been privileged to, to be able to help with this project. I want to go now to the, to the farthest north you can go in, in Brazil, up to the border with Venezuela and Guyana. This has been a conservation success story for an interesting reason. This is an area where indigenous groups felt that their land was under threat by rice growers coming in from the outside. They argued that their land included much more than the land just around their villages. And in a hugely important decision by the Brazilian Supreme Court, that land tenure was, was confirmed. Now, Dr. Mariana Valle, who I think is going to be um, working this presentation, here's a photograph of her, um, Mariana chose to work in, in this northern region of Brazil, in Roraima, because of its significance for, for biodiversity. But she quickly realized that she needed to become involved in the local community. These are a group of wonderful young men and women. And I think you can see that they're all holding something in their hands. I believe Mariana took this photograph, but what she certainly did was to get a research grant to train these young men and women to use a GPS. And in using a GPS, these indigenous groups could map out the land that they believe is theirs. They could map out the places where they hunt, where they fish, where they collect medicinal plants, and in doing so, define the land that was land that they used traditionally. I think 
what Mariana was doing here is a hugely important and significant contribution. Many people were involved in protecting the rights of these indigenous people. But as we shall see, in doing so, in protecting indigenous reserves, we are protecting the forest, we're protecting very large areas of the Amazon. And giving them their land tenure and their rights is a very significant step for conservation. Okay, so we know that Brazil has been very effective at setting aside protected areas. Uh, but the question is, you know, do protected areas work? Well, the answer is they do. At least they do in, in a couple of ways that we can detect. Uh, protected areas retain their forest cover and, and they certainly prevent fires. These are, I'm afraid, complicated slides. But basically what the slides at the top do is to take a transect from inside a reserve, through the reserve boundaries, out to areas well outside the reserve. The slide at the top left are various reserves in the Amazon. The slide at the right are various reserves in the Mata Atlantica. As you can see, reserves like Zhou in, in the Amazon um, there's a lot of forest inside the reserve, there's a lot of forest outside of the reserve. But however one explains that, and it's surely due to the fact that these reserves are remote, so there's little damage outside the reserves and no damage inside the reserves, the reserves still work. But importantly, even in areas of very high density, like the reserve I show at the bottom. There is a lot of forest inside the reserve, and of course, there's a lot of habitat destruction out of it. You might think, well, of course. But if I was showing you reserves in, say, Western Africa, this would not be the case. In West Africa, you find, and other parts of the world, incidentally, we find that many reserves simply don't work. Tragically, they don't work, but for whatever reason, the reserves don't work, and therefore, at least the forest cover inside the reserves uh, is destroyed. This is a map of the Brazilian Amazon. All the red are fires. The green, the light green, are areas of forest, the darker green are areas of forest that are protected. Most of the Amazon is protected, not by national parks like Zhou, but protected by indigenous reserves. I think you can see very clearly that where you have indigenous reserves, you don't have fires. And I will be able to prove that to you in a minute. This is a map of, of where deforestation happens. The background is the different levels of rainfall. The Amazon is a lot wetter in the northwest than in the southeast. But that map of where deforestation takes place is essentially a map of where fires are. So if you suppress fires, you also suppress deforestation. The map can be analyzed statistically. And what you see for both high impact forest, that's the forests down in the southeast that are drier and where there's more people. And the low impact forests, which are the forests in the northwest, which have fewer people, is that there's a lot fewer fires as you move away from roads. And where you have reserves, you have very fewer fires. The scale in both these plots is a logarithmic one. 
So this represents an order of magnitude difference between areas inside reserves and outside reserves. Quite simply, indigenous reserves, national parks in the Amazon are very effective at reducing fires and, of course, the habitat destruction that they cause. The decision of the Brazilian Supreme Court in the issues involving Roraima, as well as other land use decisions in Brazil that give rights to indigenous people, are hugely important in protecting biological diversity. Okay, so we have to talk about Norway. The satellite image that I show here, it's actually from a weather satellite, is about a thousand kilometers uh, east to west. It was taken on the 15th of August, 1999. I use this particular date because on that date, I flew from, uh, I flew from Sao Paulo to, uh, to Manaus. And it was one of the worst years for fires. Brazil, I think, burned 25,000 square kilometers of, of the Amazon in 1999. The white areas you can see are cloud, but as you can see, there's a huge amount of, of yellow and brown, and those, are, and those are fires. Some of those fires were enormous. The, the plumes of smoke blew hundreds of kilometers downwind. Indeed, the fires themselves were enormous, flying at um, 10,000 meters, some of, the, some of the, the plumes of smoke reached up to the airplane over large parts of the Amazon. In fact, you couldn't see very much on the ground because there was so much smoke. Well, um, we know now that Brazil has reduced its deforestation and done it um, for two years in a row. I don't have the data for 2010. They have only just been released, and I haven't had a chance to, to look at them. But if you look at the rate of deforestation in 2008, it was a typical year. 15,000 square kilometers of forest was destroyed, and much of it in Pará and the Mato Grosso. And then compare it to 2009 as well as 2010. You see that the rate of deforestation has has come down spectacularly. I had the opportunity to interview uh, Brazil's environment minister, Carlos Mink, shown at the right. And I asked him, well, you know, how did Brazil do it? How has Brazil managed to reduce its deforestation rate? He did not know, I think, that I was a scientist. I was simply, uh, along with some other reporters from places like the New York Times and the Washington Post. I was fortunate to be in that group. So I was surprised and very pleased with his first answer. He said, good science. And indeed, INPE has much to be proud of. Satellite monitoring of the deforestation has allowed Brazil to show exactly where deforestation is taking place. The second answer, of course, is that it's also good enforcement. And that's been paid for in part by a billion dollar grant promised from Norway. The point is that we in the West, those of us from North America, from Europe, put an enormous amount of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere the cheapest way of reducing greenhouse gas emissions is to stop burning tropical forests. Until recently, the four top greenhouse gas emitters were China, the United States, Brazil, and Indonesia. Brazil and Indonesia were there because of their deforestation. There is so much we can do economically with deals like the one between Norway and Brazil. The numbers are broadly these. 
One hectare of tropical forest contains something like 150 tons of carbon. If you burn um, 20,000 square kilometers of tropical forest each year, that puts a huge amount of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. But importantly, we can restore forest in much the same way as we were doing in the project I talked about earlier um, near um, Heavy Oyunyao. A hectare of land of bad cattle pasture can sequester probably seven and a half tons of carbon per year for 20 years. If we could do that over the poor cattle pasture that has been created in Brazil and so many other tropical countries, we could take care of a very significant amount of the, the carbon dioxide that's now in the atmosphere and causing climate disruption. So that brings me to my final thought. How much of a threat is there of global warming to Brazil's biodiversity? Well, we know two broad things about the warming planet. It's getting warmer, but it's getting a lot more warmer in the temperate and Arctic regions than in the tropics. So the blue data are for a whole bunch of weather stations north of 65 degrees north, and the green are for the tropics. The tropics are not warming as much as, as the Arctic. On the other hand, species may be a lot more sensitive to change in the tropics. What happens when it warms? Are species moving? Well, this is a study done in Britain I have to tell you that I grew up in Britain. Britain has a wretchedly low amount of biodiversity. There are perhaps only 50 species of butterfly in all of the British Isles, most of them very rare. I suspect you can probably go to the Jardin Botanico in here de Janeiro and see twice that number in the morning. Britain has very, very few species. But the British, perhaps because they have so few species, do tend to care about them a lot. And when people see what they find to be interesting butterflies, they record where they are very carefully. So this little brown butterfly, uh, prior to 1939, was seen only where the black dots are, uh, the red dots were 1940 to 1969, the blue dots 1970 to 1999. As the climate warms, species are moving northwards. Now, that may be very good for the British, who now get to see a few butterflies. But it can be disastrous for species in Brazil. This is um, the state of Rio de Janeiro. It's looking northeast. And so I can hope you can find Guanabara Bay at the uh, top right of the picture. The area shown in blue is the current range of um, the black and gold Katinga, Tijuca Atra. It's found on mountain tops throughout southeastern Brazil. It's one of my favorite birds. It has a hauntingly beautiful whistle. It's, a, it's something that keeps you a company when you're hiking in the mountains. But if the climate warms a degree, then this species will lose almost all of its range. This is an even more difficult bird to find. This is Tijuca Condita, Tijuca Escondida as we call it, because we spent so much time looking for it. It's an extremely rare, hard to find bird that lives at the very, very tops of the mountains. Working with my colleague, uh, Dr. Maria Lise Alves from Oeg, um, we mounted an expedition to look for it on a variety of mountaintops. It was only known from 
uh, uh, from, from Chinguá and, and Cerro dos Organs. We found it on some of the other mountain tops. Species like this has nowhere else to go if it warms. In short, we are in danger of losing a substantial fraction of the species in Brazil, particularly southeastern Brazil. And what's worse, these are not the species that have been harmed by habitat destruction, by deforestation. These are the species that up to now have done relatively well. What can we do about that? Well, one of the things we can do about it is to sequester as much carbon as we can by restoring land, like the project that I showed you at, um, uh, at Heavy OU now, and of course, stopping the deforestation, which Brazil seems to have been very successful at doing for the last two years. So why does Brazil's biodiversity matter? I have my reasons, of course. But no one expresses those reasons as well as my students. And Louisa expressed those concerns very passionately. I'd like to share a video clip of her now. I care about the planet because it's the place we live and the only place we can live. If it's still not enough, I can think of some other reasons. First of all, it's beautiful. I was raised surrounded by green and I learned to love and respect life as an end in itself. The world's not ours to do what we please. We share it with millions of other species, but we alone are consuming two-fifths of the planet plant's biomass. Isn't it just too greedy? I know that many people don't care about other species, but how about other human beings? Global warming, deforestation, loss of biodiversity affects agriculture, water cycles, water supplies, fishery, air quality, and aggravates floods, droughts, and other weather phenomena. In Brazil, we like to say that God is Brazilian because we are blessed with no volcanoes, hurricanes, or tsunamis. Until recently, when huge windstorms hit the southern states, left in thousands homeless. Scientists estimate that billions of people can become weather refugees within this century. It's many more than war victims all combined. Global changes are democratic. They affect everybody, disregarding sex, color, religion, or social status. Medicinal plants can become extinct without being discovered. The oceans, responsible for the majority of oxygen production, are collapsing. We are approaching the tipping point, the point of no return. I believe we still have a chance to avoid extinction, including our own, but we'll need to change a lot of things, and fast.